Arknet, the most commercially successful and widely deployed LAN technology of the early 1980s, and I guess you're wondering, what the heck was it and what the heck happened to it? Well, if you are, this, this video is probably for you. But before we get to all that good stuff, it's time for a quick word from our sponsor, PCB Way. Yes, you're all familiar with them, that company that sponsors lots of content on YouTube. They also have a side hustle in producing PCBs. And also 3D printing, CNC machining, they even do pick and place to go with their PCB service. So if you're the sort of person who's been linking all your components together by soldering little wires, you may wish to consider a PCB from PCB Way. <laughs> Arknet was created by John Murphy, who was that time working underneath Victor Poor, a name that should be a lot more familiar to people than it actually is. And I will go into that briefly in a second, and both of them worked for Datapoint, a company that had been previously known as Computer Terminal Corporation. Based on that name, you can probably guess that they're a company that made terminals for computers. And when Victor Poor joined the company, he suggested to them that they should make use of a little idea he'd come up with that Thanksgiving in his living room with his friend Harry File. Now that idea was a microprocessor. In fact, it would become the world's first 8-bit microprocessor. And they brought in a little-known chip fab at the time known as Intel, as they didn't have their own chip fabrication capability. And using this microprocessor, they created a terminal called the Datapoint 2200. Except that's not what happens. It turns out it takes too long for Intel to get this thing made, so they end up using a bunch of TTL logic, and that turns out to have been cheaper anyway. Intel got a design for what became the Intel 8088, that was then developed further to become the 8080 and the 8086. You know, the thing we all know Intel for. I know what some of you are thinking, wait a minute, Intel didn't invent the only successful microprocessor line that they've ever had. And the answer is, no, no they didn't. Yeah, this, this guy did instead. Victor Poor. This, this is why we should know who this guy is. Yep, every Intel originated line of CPUs, i.e. they came up with themselves, has been a massive stinking failure. Every last one of them. In fact, I may have documented a surprisingly large number of them. I bring this up not just because it bugs me that people think that Intel invented this stuff when they didn't, but because it's important to know that Datapoint had a pretty good technology track record before they even get round to inventing ArcNet. And that as bosses and mentors go, John Murphy really couldn't have done much better than Victor Poor. Now, John Murphy came up with the idea for ArcNet and did all the development for it in 1976, with it being released in 1977, just like Star Wars. And the original idea of ArcNet was to connect their data point terminals to the 8-inch floppy disk system that they were making. Now, although ArcNet was not the first ever LAN technology, it was the first one that wasn't built for a particular computer system. They were fairly agnostic. They didn't care what kind of computer you added to this network. Whereas things like DECnet obviously made an assumption that, well, there was a DEC computer going to go on it, or IBM's SNA, which again, assumed it was an IBM mainframe going on this thing. In fact, the ARC bit of ARCnet gives you a clue as how they intended it to be used, as it stands for Attached Resource Computer Network. I, they intended it to be a network to attach resources to the computer, like the 8 in floppy disk drive and terminals. Now, Datapoint did not have to wait long for ARCnet to become a success as it enabled businesses to easily add more terminals if they needed more users, add more mini-computers if they outgrew the capacity of the one that they had. If they wanted more storage, well, they could add that to ArcNet too. By the end of the 1970s, there were over 10,000 ArcNet networks deployed commercially, which, given we're yet to invent the IBM PC at this point, that's going some. And in fact, turned Datapoint into a Fortune 500 company, and all that just in the 11 years of its existence so far. And then we hit 1981. Yes, one year after the release of The Empire Strikes Back, IBM releases the IBM PC. Yes, the computer that would eventually take over most business computing that contained, you know, that Intel microprocessor, the one invented by Datapoint. And soon after its release, the fight would be on for which LAN technology would come to dominate for the IBM PC. And, well, ArcNet was off to a flying start. Now, one of its key early advantages in this market was that it already existed and was in use. After all, there were already 10,000 networks out there before the IBM PC even existed. So that was a lot of trained-up engineers who knew about this technology. Now, those of you familiar with the early history of networking will be screaming, but, but, actually, Ethernet already existed. Slow those fingers in the comment section. <laughs> yes, Park Labs did create Ethernet first. In fact, they did most of the development work between 73 and 74. But, like with all things to do with the Park Lab and Xerox, they didn't 
do anything with the technology for a while. In fact, it wasn't until 1976 that they deployed their own Ethernet network amongst their own computers in the lab. And then, they didn't really even bother commercialising it in any way. In fact, we have to wait until Bob Metcalf leaves Park Labs and goes sets up Freecom, and he sets up an alliance with DEC, Intel, and Xerox to promote Ethernet as a technology. And that technology doesn't get published as a standard until 1980. And that's not the version of Ethernet that most of us have ever used. Ethernet version 2, which is where they finally sorted out the framing stuff, that didn't happen until 1982. And then after that we have to wait one more year until 1983 for that to become the 802.3 standard, which is what all current Ethernet implementations are based off. So ArcNet has a surprisingly clear run at the field, at least for a year or two while the IBM PC is getting going. Now ArcNet's design gives it a few advantages right off the bat. First it is this whole computer agnostic thing. It wasn't designed to work with just one type of computer and one kind of CPU architecture. Although to be fair, they did have a lot of experience at leaking it to these funky new Intel processors. And due to that experience, they managed to make it not very demanding on the CPU. I'll come on to the how and whys of that later when we go into the whole technical look at how ArcNet actually works compared to say, Ethernet for example. But suffice to say at this point, it's better suited for the CPU power levels that we're dealing with at this point. Because after all, they had to make it work with those data point terminals. Also, with their over 10,000 networks already deployed and in use, plenty of people have heard of ArcNet and have experience with ArcNet, so you can find engineers and staff to help you run and manage this thing. Whereas poor old Ethernet has been, well, effectively trapped in the park labs for a surprisingly long period of time, although quite a few influential people who had read the papers based around it, your average IT technician had never heard of it, and what's more, no one had ever touched or seen the thing. Unless you were one of the like 20 people who worked at Park. And that seems to be a bit of a recurring thing for all things Park Lab related. You invent the future and don't tell anyone about it because it might hurt your photocopier business. I swear Xerox ran that place as just a location where they could find out a list of things that will eventually kill us. The other big early advantage ArcNet has is that of price. ArcNet is cheaper than everything else. Now you may wonder when multi-billion dollar corporations are buying computers, why the heck do they give a monkeys about the price? But you would be amazed at how cheap ass these companies can be sometimes, particularly if they're going to need more than one of something. To give you some pricing examples, an ArcNet card for a PC would cost around $300. An Ethernet card would cost around $500. You then have to connect a $200 transceiver on the end of that to get it to plug into a cable. So you're looking at a cost difference of you can do two workstations with ArcNet for the cost of one workstation with Ethernet. So costing half as much as your nearest competitor, yeah, that's pretty good when it comes to driving adoption, isn't it? So you might be thinking to yourself, if it costs half as much, why the heck aren't we still using ArcNet now? Well, it's time to have a look at how these things work and we can Look at the technical differences between them. Oddly, I'm going to start with Ethernet and how that works. As it's the simpler of the two, and also it's easy to explain the advantages of ArcNet once you've seen how Ethernet works. Now, I have actually covered how Ethernet works before in my video on Token Ring, so I'm not going to go into it into a load of detail here and now. I mean, if you want to know even more, go watch the Token Ring video. I mean, obviously, after you've watched this one. I really do know how to sabotage my own viewing figures, don't I? Ethernet uses a technique known as CSMA slash CD, which is short for Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection. But that is a posh way of saying that all Ethernet cards were plugged into one big long thin wire, and before they transmitted, they would listen on the wire to see if any of the other stations were transmitting, and if not, they'd transmit onto the wire. And this has the obvious flaw of what happens if two workstations do that at the exact same time? Well, that's where the collision detection part comes in. As each workstation transmits, it listens. If the signal on the wire does not match the one that it is transmitting, well, it knows it's collided. You then get what's known as the jam signal, which tells all the other stations a collision has occurred and to not transmit. The machines then involved in the collision back off for a random period of time. The first one to transmit ideally wins and the others then don't transmit. In the event that the random back off time is the same between two workstations, well, there's another collision and we all try again. Now, one of the features of this is if you're one of the workstations that does not transmit out first, but you're involved in the jam, well, then you just wait for the network to be clear and then you transmit again. Now, this does mean that 
after one collision, typically there's at least another one or two come on its heels fairly shortly afterwards. Now, ArcNet works on a totally different system. For a start, the cabling topology is very different. With Ethernet at this point in time, thin coax was the dominant standard. So you had one piece of cable that looped around all your workstations and each of them tapped into it with a T-piece. ArcNet was deployed in a star topology, i.e. there were these central little hubs that you would connect each workstation into. And these hubs could be passive or active, i.e. they were powered or not powered. And this meant it was a hell of a lot easier to plug a new workstation into the network because you didn't have to break the one cable that joins them all together. You could just plug another one into the hub and if you needed more, well, you just plug another hub in. Ethernet scheme also limited cable length as well. Think it could be about 190 meters max, a 50 ohm terminator at either end. With ArcNet, the distance between powered or active hubs was about 600 meters. And from network card to an active hub, about 300 meters. Passive hubs were a different story. There was about a 13 meter cable limit on that one. Now admittedly, eventually Ethernet would also move to using a star topology, but over twisted pair rather than coax. The major difference between the two schemes, however, was that ArcNet is a token-based system. So if you imagine as Ethernet works more like a room full of toddlers just all trying to scream at each other, ArcNet works like a slightly more organized classroom where the teacher passes around the thing and you can talk when you hold the token. You know, like Lord of the Flies, only without the murder. Now, some of you may have heard of Token Ring or watched the video I did on Token Ring. And that system also uses a token and has a ring topology rather than a star topology. And in a ring, it's fairly obvious how the token gets passed around. It gets passed around from one station to the next round the ring. Except in a star, we have to have a way for, well, the order of passing the token, as there isn't a ring. Now, the way this works is linked to the addressing scheme that's in use in ArcNet that we haven't really talked about yet. Now, you may be familiar with how Ethernet does this, because MAC addresses are a thing in wireless cards as well, and have stuck around. Each card has a unique hardware address. In ArcNet, things are a little bit different. Your card doesn't come with a built-in hardware address that makes every card unique. In ArcNet, every station has an 8-bit station number, and that number is set on the card using DIP switches. That means the network admin needs to manually set an address for each device on the network, which frankly was a bit of a pain. But at least in most cases, they put the dip switches on the back of the card, so you didn't have to open up the case to set the station address. This is a very similar system to Echonet in this regard, only with less case opening. Now, when a station joined the network, a reconfig event happened. And during the reconfig, each station would learn the station number above it on the network. That way, when a station receives the token, it knows to then pass it on to the station number above it. When it reaches the highest number station, well, it sends it on to the lowest numbered station. This means in ArcNet, there's no collisions. It also means that the bandwidth is shared evenly between those machines wanting to transmit. One kid can't just monopolize the room by just screaming the loudest and the longest. This makes ArcNet's performance predictable. We know how it will behave under load situations. This makes it very different to Ethernet, where in Ethernet, it can perform really well if there's a low number of stations wanting to transmit. I mean, you don't have to wait for the token to come round. When the station wants to transmit, assuming the network's clear, it can. There's no waiting around for the token to be yours. However, when the network's under load, well, then you mostly get collisions. Whereas ArcNet will very efficiently slice its bandwidth between all the stations that want to transmit. The way ArcNet also transmits when it's got the token is very different to Ethernet. Ethernet's approach is crap the packet onto the wire, the other end better catch and listen to it, and if it fails to, because it's either not there or, you know, it's buffers full, well then some higher level protocol's just gonna have to take care of that. Now if you remember before, I mentioned that ArcNet was very well suited to micros of this period, because you didn't need a lot of compute power to run it. And part of that is how it does the transmission stuff, which is what we're going to talk about now. Rather than Ethernet's just fire and forget technique, before ArcNet transmits its packet, it sends out a small buffer inquiry packet. The receiving station then replies with, does it have space in its buffer or not for a data packet? If the answer is yes, we then transmit our 500 octet data packet. If no, we just pass the token onto the next machine and let the network get on with the rest of its life. In the event that we've sent our data packet, well, there's one last little packet that comes back from the receiving machine to say, I got that packet, or that packet was complete gibberish. 
It's this four-packet conversation that occurs that makes life a lot cheaper for small micros. For a start, we manage buffer space a lot better, which is really convenient when, you, you know, memory's expensive. The other thing, this acknowledging that you got the packet, this makes the implementation of higher protocols a lot easier because you don't have to worry about waiting for timeouts to know if a packet succeeded or failed. And this means we're burning less CPU cycles on this, which with early 80s processing speed kind of actually matters from a performance point of view. So now we know how the two work, you're probably thinking, how the heck did Ethernet win over ArcNet when technically it's less sophisticated in some regards? And also bear in mind, at least in the early 80s, it's not a cost thing. ArcNet is cheaper. It's also more widely installed. It's not like Ethernet got there first. ArcNet had thousands of networks deployed before Ethernet even came to market. So as the 80s rolled on and we get into the 90s, how did Ethernet surpass it quite so spectacularly? And as with all things, there are a number of things at play at once with this thing. The first one we're gonna get into is bandwidth and people's inability to understand the implications on throughput from both bandwidth and collisions. Ethernet was a 10 megabit standard and ArcNet was a 2.5 megabit standard. And ArcNet had to deal with the fact that 10 is bigger than two and a half. I mean, it was very much a problem for ArcNet. It's fairly easy to understand that Ethernet is faster than ArcNet, except for of course when it isn't. But trying to explain a concept like collisions in marketing literature, yeah, that, that doesn't go over very well. You can just say, we run at 10 megabit, they run at 2.5. Guess which one's faster? And in a situation where you've got two stations on an Ethernet network and one's transmitting and one's just listening, well then, yeah, it's, it's faster. It's even lower latency too. But that's not a common deployment strategy. <laughs> if you say I have 30 or 40 stations on a network and they all want to transmit, well, that 10 megabit isn't being used very efficiently. Its worst case throughput is substantially lower than that of ArcNet worst case throughput because every machine takes it in turn. The bandwidth is evenly shared. There's no collisions. This is way harder to explain in marketing literature and especially to the sort of people who control the purse strings of corporations. They just see 10 is bigger than 2.5. And also, there's no YouTube at this point so you can't just point them to a friendly video that explains this stuff to them. So this is one of the factors that Ethernet uses to start pushing ahead in its marketing. The next one we're going to come to is cost. Now initially ArcNet is very much the cheaper solution. Now that's both in terms of the actual ArcNet hardware you have to buy, network cards and hubs, but also in terms of the impact on the machine that uses it. This is why we see a lot of ArcNet cards for fairly low CPU power micros of the time. So in the mid 80s you see Commodore releases an ArcNet card for the Amiga 500. They also get some out for their big box A2000 as well. Although later on they will produce an Ethernet card as well, or at least for the 2000. 500 never gets one from Commodore. But as computers start to have more memory and CPU power, the impact on the machine starts to become more negligible as time goes on. We also see the price of Ethernet cards start to fall. And the big player in this is Novell. Novell's netware had been getting quite popular as a client server platform for DOS. It let you store files centrally on your network server and you could log into it and different people could have access to different files. And if you were a bit feeling on the budget, it could also remote boot workstations so you didn't need a local hard disk. Now, one of the things holding Netware back was the cost of network cards, so Novell decided that they were going to develop a cheap Ethernet card. Not only did they plan for this network card to be cheap itself, but they were finally going to integrate the little media access unit you had hanging off your AUI port on your network card. This is the thing that went from AUI to Fin Coax, or UTP. Now, traditionally, Ethernet cards had just had an AUI interface and you bought this separate box to connect you to whatever the cabling system was. And these little media access boxes, well, they were expensive. They cost nearly the same amount as the Ethernet card. So by integrating these into the Ethernet card itself, Novell made things a lot cheaper. You could now buy an NE2000 for around $400 and not have to spend another $400 on the little AUI adapter. Now, this became a little virtuous circle for both Novell and Ethernet. Cheaper Ethernet cards meant more people could use Netware, and Netware's popularity helped drive the popularity of Ethernet. Technically, Novell could run on top of any of the 802-based networking standards that were out there. So, for example, Ethernet and Token Ring. They did also support ArcNet. But with Novell pushing the NE2000, NE2000 compatible cards kind of became the de facto standard for using Netware with. 
to the point where a number of network cards today can still emulate ME2000 surprisingly well in hardware. And that's where the next major drop in network card pricing happened. Lots of vendors suddenly started cloning ME2000 compatible cards, and this soon became a race to the bottom price-wise, to the point where, in the early 90s, you could buy an ME2000 compatible ISA card for about 20 or 30 quid. Although ArcNet had established an early lead in terms of numbers that it maintained most of the way through to the middle of the 80s, towards the end of the 80s, the number of deployments of Ethernet and ArcNet were about the same, and they'd seen their way neatly through the 8-bit era into the 16, but as we were getting into the 32-bit era in the 90s, that's when the popularity of Netware, the ever-decreasing price of Ethernet cards, and ArcNet standard history really started to kick in, and Ethernet started to take the lead. ArcNet had started life as a proprietary standard for networking, at a time where that was just how everything was. They'd done well in the mini-computer era, they'd done well in the early 8-bit era, even getting network cards into the like of the TRS-80. There were ArcNet cards for 16-bit machines, like the Amiga, although they never sold overly well, and they'd done pretty well in the PC space as well. But Datapoint had never really opened this thing up, there weren't lots of different manufacturers. In the mid-80s, they did turn this into an ANSI standard, and this meant that Netware now had something that they could target. But Netware was fairly synonymous with Ethernet. They were also a bit too late in the game at getting other manufacturers involved in making ArcNet cards. Yes, other manufacturers did eventually get to do it, but not as many as they were making Ethernet cards, and those economies of scale started to kick in, and Ethernet cards got cheaper and cheaper. And why ArcNet cards did get cheaper, not on the same sort of scale. Ethernet also gained the ability to start using unshielded twisted pair cabling and a start apology, which again took away one of the advantages of ArcNet. In that regard, Ethernet had caught up. In the early 90s is also the time that far more organisations were deploying LAN technologies than had happened before. Previously, it had mostly been the preserve of big companies with IT departments. Now, pretty much any small company could just get a local business to come in, fit them a little network and go away again. And they are way more small to medium enterprises than there are large corporate ones. So Ethernet was the cheaper price point at just the right time for this market to explode. We also see Ethernet cards much more readily supported in the various operating systems that are starting to appear as well at this point in time. So for example, Microsoft supports any 2000 cards right out of the box of its Windows for Work groups. Personal Netware appears and again supports any 2000 right out of the box. There's no mucking about trying to do things differently from everybody else. And it's not that ArcNet just instantly dies. In fact, there are still ArcNet-based things out there today. It's just it never really makes it into this new exploding space of small SME-type networks. And cost also then becomes a driving factor in larger networks for things moving over to Ethernet. Also, the bandwidth of 2.5 megabits starts to really become a problem for ArcNet at this time. Because if you really like the token approach, and you're prepared to pay a bit more for it, well, then Token Ring does... 8 or 16 megabits. And also, in terms of network framing, it's a lot more like Ethernet, so you can actually have bridges into Ethernet, whereas you can't bridge packets between ArcNet and Ethernet. This means you can have expensive, more performant under load sections of your network, and cheaper, less performant under load sections of your network. You can mix and match if you want. Token Ring also has IBM making a whole bunch of products for it and IBM's massive global sales and consultancy force pushing it too. Now, Datapoint doesn't just throw in the towel at this point with ArcNet. I mean, it can see the way things are heading, and it decides they're going to try and do something about it. And this is where we get ArcNet Plus, which is like the original ArcNet. In fact, it's compatible with it, but runs at 20 megabits a second. That's 10 whole megabits more than Ethernet. Now, Datapoint must have felt pretty chuffed with themselves on this achievement, as finally they'd done something about what was then the biggest criticism of ArcNet, its speed. But the problem with solving a problem once you've seen the writing on the wall is that it's just that, well, bit too late. We don't see ArcNet Plus until 1992. And by that point, this explosion in the SME space of lands, well, it had happened. Most of the companies that were going to do it had done it, and they'd bought Ethernet. And also, with the next generation of equipment and large expansions of their existing networks, plenty of places that were running ArcNet had removed it and gone to Ethernet already, so they weren't going to go to the trouble of switching back. 
There was then that market segment that wanted a much more high performance under load network, and a lot of them had switched away to using token ring, and ArcNet still wasn't quite as good at token ring in some regards. Now, you might be thinking, what, at 20 megabits versus 16? But you've still only got a 500 octet packet with this thing, whereas it's 1500 octets with token ring. So each packet has more data packed into it. So it is still somewhat more efficient, and therefore the actual throughput between token ring and ArcNet Plus are pretty much the same with the same number of workstations. Token Ring can also boast having a frame type that's compatible with Ethernet, therefore you can bridge between Token Ring and Ethernet. You can't bridge between ArcNet Plus and Ethernet. And then there's the whole IBM thing as well. So this is where we see a slow fading out of ArcNet from the world of LAN technologies and PCs. But ArcNet doesn't just die. It just kind of changes the space it's operating in. It's still a reliable, importantly, predictable networking technology that's also relatively cost-effective compared to, say, Token Ring, for example. Or at least in the sectors of automotive and plant and manufacturing equipment. Here, bandwidth and, you know, support in netware and other things doesn't really matter. And ArcNet does continue to flourish in this space. It does really well at running manufacturer plants and robots and stuff like that. And you will still find it on factory floors today. Admittedly, nowhere near as widely as you used to see it, but it's still there and it's still doing its job. If it works, places like these don't tend to rip it out. A lot of factories have run their manufacturing kit until basically it explodes or catches fire or crumbles to dust. Because you're talking millions of pounds of equipment here. So if it still does the job that it did when they fitted it, yeah, they have no interest in replacing this. So hence ArcNet has had a very, very long tail, which is why you can still find ArcNet drivers in the Linux kernel, because, well, there are people still using it. Now, you might be thinking we're all done with the tail of ArcNet now, and we almost are. There's just one tiny little weird moment left to discuss, and that's when there was a third and final ArcNet-based technology, and that's the 100 megabit version, this time not developed by Datapoint, but created by the Thomas Conrad Corporation, and it was known as TCNS. And to be fair, it enjoyed a limited window of success, like the, the smallest quantum of success you could possibly think of, as low-cost 100 meg Ethernet turned up and killed it dead. And after that, a 100 meg token ring appeared and died on its ass, as the Ethernet switch had come into existence and negated the whole advantage of tokens, really. As the Ethernet switch basically more or less got rid of collisions, they still exist. They happen very, very rarely, though, even on a loaded network. If you've made it to this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed strolling through the history of ArcNet. Our comment section is open below so we can all talk about ArcNet and ArcNet-related things. And if you enjoyed the video, why? YouTube's created a special button to indicate that fact. It's, it's called the thumbs up. And if you'd like to help the channel out, why not click the subscribe button? It's free, and it encourages YouTube to tell people that these videos actually exist.